Okay, thank you so much everybody for watching. My name is Matt Fox and this is Break a Read. Today, all the way from Evanston, Illinois, I have a good friend of mine, Julian Velasco. How's it going, Julian? It's great, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. You know, how, how are things out in Illinois? How are you doing? It's, it's good out here. It's very rainy today, it's, uh, but you know, I'd say that Evanston is a nice kind of meet middle ground between what you want Chicago to be and maybe more like, you know, suburban life. So it's relatively calm out here, which is nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Are, where you are, is it kind of like busy and bustling or is it more? Uh, like... I mean, we have a downtown area, but definitely compared to like the city of Chicago, it's not too bad. Um, I would say that, you know, I'm still like a 45 minute train ride in from like downtown area. So. Oh, that's yeah, that's far. So, yeah, so I mean, we, we have enough that it's like, you don't feel like you're living in a college town, but it's not, you know, downtown, downtown. That's awesome. Yeah, I yeah. like that. Cool. So you just graduated with your master's, right? I did. That that's was so exciting. Uh, well, this past weekend, I think. Yeah. Just Congratulations. Was... Thank you. Thank you. You I did it. it. You did the thing. Seriously. <laughs> we, we did it. It's, it's here. Now, yeah. you know, it's like that weird, it's that weird, awkward in between area between, you know, when you finish a degree and then people ask what's next, you know, you know, I, and just for clarity's sake, uh, I, I'm not continuing on to a doctorate right away. So I'm taking a gap year or maybe a okay. gap in a couple years. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to talk to people and they ask, you know, what's next and not quite having the answer either. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, never a bad thing. Yeah, no, a, I, yeah. I don't think it's prompt at all, but. Cool, awesome. So I wanted to you know, start off maybe with you giving a brief background of you know, your upbringing, what you know, made you decide to go to the schools you chose to go to, um, certain opportunities you've had musically throughout your years in academia. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm from Los Angeles. Um, from a town called Whittier, which is uh, the southernmost part of Los Angeles County. Uh, and my dad is a musician. Both my parents are professional musicians, actually. So my mom's a cellist and my dad's a jazz saxophonist. And um, so at an early age, I think it was like middle school band, you know, you had to choose your instrument. And I was a pianist before that. And so I decided that I was going to play saxophone because, you know, my dad's a saxophonist. Why not yeah. get free lessons? Um, and uh, so I stuck with that and I went to high school at a place called Orange County School of the Arts, which is um, a charter school in Orange County, which is where I met my first private instructor outside of my dad. And his name's James Barrera. He teaches at the Cal State, uh, Cal State University, Long Beach. And okay. he, he studied with uh, Dr. Murphy and Eugene Rousseau um, at Indiana and also with Leo Potts, who used to be the former faculty at Cal State Long Beach. So, cool. uh, and, and my dad went to Cal State Long Beach and studied with Leo. So it's like kind of all similar, similar networks and stuff like that. So, but James was, James was uh, my, my largest instructor. Um, he taught me for five years until uh, it was when I found out about Michigan State and uh, Michigan State, I got a call junior year of high school and uh, from my dad, he was like, hey, this is gonna sound weird, but do you know who Joe Lulop is? And I was like, not a clue in the world. Um, and he's like, well, uh, he's looking for people around your age. Would you be interested in grabbing a lesson with him? And uh, uh, Yamaha set it up, a, a guy named uh, Rory, uh, who interfaced between the two. And so I played a bear for him. And you know, it, it, you know Joe Lulop. He's he's a kooky guy, and he was really energetic. And I was like, who is this man? And James is a very reserved, you know, really like like cut and dry kind of guy. So I was like, this is wildly different. Um, and so he encouraged me to do Brevard, and I did the Brevard Music Center going into my senior year to get a taste as to whether or not I wanted cool. to study with with Joe and stuff like that. And had a great experience out there. Um, met Casey Grev, who ended up becoming my TA later, um, and now teaches at SUNY, SUNY Potsdam. Um, so I went, I, eventually I just like, yeah, I want to study with this guy. I had a great time working with him and he really believed in kind of what I was doing. So I went to Michigan State uh, and was there for five years. I got two degrees in uh, classical performance and jazz studies. Um, and then Actually, at Brevard Music Center is where I met Tamar Sullivan, 
uh, I he awesome. he came up. He always visits. Or he always goes camping out there, and so he came by one time, and I was just getting ready to play uh, Glazunov for their concerto competition, and uh, Professor Lulov was like, "Hey, Tamor, come listen," and dra basically dragged him into this practice room where I was doing a run through, and uh, that's when I first met him. Um, at that time, was he teaching in North Carolina still? Yeah, he was still at UNCSA at the time. Okay. Um, and anyway, um, yeah, and so uh, that's when I first met him. But then at the end of my time at MSU, I was looking to move to kind of a larger metropolitan area. And uh, I had a really good friend that went here, Jordan Luloff, and he really highly recommended the experience. Um, and just a lot of things kept looking like, um, you know, this would be kind of a place that I would want to stay for a while. So mm -hmm. uh, ended up applying here and a couple other schools and you know, I was very lucky to have the opportunity to attend here in general. So, and I just finished here and it was a great time, but yeah. And then I finished my master's here at, at Northwestern. Yeah. That's so awesome. That's crazy. You've really like, even right from the get go in high school, you kind of went all over the country. Yeah. It was, it was such, it was such a big jump that first, you know, 18 and you go, you know, from sunny California to, uh, to Michigan and that yeah. year, 2013, that was the polar vortex year. And so I went from That's like right. never seeing snow to, um, you know, the first time MSU being canceled for snow in like 40 years or something like that. Yeah. So, you know, you and I did the complete opposites. I went from snowy right. upstate New York all the way to like the hottest summers ever. Yeah. 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 Such a shift, such a shift. <laughs> was not quite ready for that. I bought, uh, like uh, first day of freshman year, my, my dad and I were moving in and I bought a leather jacket because my dad and I thought that's what a winter coat was. Um, and that turned out to be a mistake last year. Yeah, it's not like not that. big enough. <laughs> not at all. I think I yeah. think it lasted until like, like the second week of October until one of the, my studio mates was like, no, we're getting you a real coat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's funny. Um, yeah, so throughout your time um, at MSU and Northwestern, you've had some really awesome um, competitive music experiences, and one of which we actually got to spend some time with each other in uh, Orlando for the MTNA yeah. in 2018? 2018? Yeah, 2018, yeah. Yeah, the MTNA finals in Orlando. That was so much fun. I, I remember like we were stuck at some, it, what town was it? Paradise. Paradise, pa Florida. Paradise, Florida. We were stuck there for like five or six hours before our flights and we were yeah. just like sat we just sat like sat on a beach right that yeah was it was some fun. some lake yeah that was a great time i had a lot of fun hanging out um man i i think that was my fifth mtna or something like that but um but yeah i mean I, i've been doing the competitive scene for a, a long time and um but that's that experience particularly because that's when we hung out with uh, Sal as well, and it was just yeah. like, a bunch of really really uh, really cool hangs, and that taco truck. I'm trying to remember I'm trying to remember where that was, but that was a good time. It was some like big like street food scene in the middle of Orlando. Right. right. Yeah. But yeah, Paradise. What a weird place. It was like this manufactured city that Disney made for tourists or something like that. It was it was really weird. But, yeah. It was fun though. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, you had MTNA, there are always the NASA hangs, but one, one competition I really wanted to get your, um, get your experience on was the Van Doren competition and yeah. you know, the, the, all the traveling and performing and all that stuff you needed to do for it. I was hoping maybe you could speak a little bit on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was 2018 as well. Uh, but I mean, I, I can like, let me just start by saying that, that that is one of my favorite experiences I've had through competitions. I mean, um, uh, so, you know, it is, it's a tape competition in like one of my favorite parts about doing competitions is being able to be live, being able to meet a bunch of other people that are doing like-minded things and to just kind of have that energy of performing. And that's the one, the one thing I kind of missed about that one. Um, but you know, it's it's a phenomenal experience. They you know they take you to Music for All, where you get to play for a bunch of people, and you get a premiere new work that's written for you with a chamber music group. Um, I premiered uh, a Matty Kovler piece, who's a he's a composer in New York and really nice guy. Um, but getting getting a chance to do that opportunity and 
um, you know, they, they really treat you really well. And the, you know, the grand prize uh, that I was really fortunate enough to have was that they take you to France, you know, David Gould so cool. flies you to France and man, I mean, I, I can't tell you how, how wonderful they were to me, how kind they were and how generous they were with just like um, making me feel like a part of their family. And, you know, David studied uh, in Paris and so he's fluent in French. And so, you know, you get to be this kind of like a, you know, stereotypical you know, dumb American that doesn't speak an ounce. Yeah. Of <laughs> um, and, you know, he, he just, he shows you his favorite parts of the city, um, his favorite parts of the food and uh, just, man, phenomenal. They take, they take you to the factories, they take you around and um, you get to meet everyone that works at Van Doren Paris. And all of those people are, are pretty, pretty lovely people. Um, and yeah, I just, uh, you know, and you get to meet the other competitors. I remember we got to go and listen to David uh, the jazz winner that year play mm -hmm. at a club down in the strip of like the you know the Paris jazz nightclubs and stuff like that and that was a lot of fun and um, yeah overall just wonderful experience um, definitely worth the recording that I did you know and at the time you know I was applying to grad school so I had a bunch of recordings kind of lying around and I, right. I, I kind of strategized with Professor Luloff at the time being like I don't want to record too many things, you know, I like grad school, like, um, I don't want to feel like I'm stretched too thin. I, I really right. want to make sure that, you know, I represent myself in the best way possible. So we took some time to really think about like what pieces I liked and resonated with, but also what I needed to show, uh, you know, prospective people that I was both working towards, but also, you know, my strengths and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the time, I think I, that was the Bolcom year. So, we did uh, all right. Sweet, and uh, I was on a real Alex Menchik kick, and I was doing uh, Ali, which is one of my favorite works for unaccompanied saxophone. Um, yeah, and Tomasi, which everyone played to death, but right, still a great concerto. Um, yeah, don't tell this, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, no, that's great experience. Van Doren, the people there, absolutely lovely, absolutely wonderful, great experience. That sounds amazing. And, you know, that's really awesome that you got to go to Paris and experience the way, you know, oh. behind the scenes with Van Doren. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. If you ever get a chance to meet David Gould and, and all and all the, that team, like they're just absolutely uh, wonderful and just really cool people. That's great. Awesome. So I kind of want to segue now a little bit into quarantine life and um, everyone, you know, kind of battles quarantine a little differently everyone takes their schedules and messes them up in their own kind of way what has been like your start to finish wake up go to bed routine like daily schedule um average days during quarantine sure um well i would say that i haven't uh, like quarantine has been interesting because one of my favorite things I love to do is saxophone quartet and not being able to rehearse with a group mm -hmm. you know I didn't realize how much I really relied on that kind of you know that drive that you know to feel like people are relying on you and the go 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 yeah yeah and like that helps really motivate me and stuff like that so um, it's been interesting to kind of you know figure out the new schedule but I you know I don't I don't try to push myself too hard I think one of the big nice things about you know this experience right now is that um, uh, is that, you know, it's a chance for everyone to kind of reflect and get a chance to kind of take a deep breath and see, you know, what really needs to be done right now. And um, I'm a big proponent of taking time off the horn and stuff like that. So I'd say that, you know, I, I get up at, you know, 10 o'clock, 1030. I, I'm not particularly in any rush to go anywhere. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't allow myself to wake up to alarms anymore. It's a personal preference. And, you know, I, I make breakfast with my roommate every morning. Um, I like that tradition of just like, you know, getting together and getting to do something. It's kind of like ritualistic in a way. And I, I believe in the power of like, you know, doing rituals together. Um, yeah. And I play a lot of Super Smash Brothers. Uh, awesome. And then, you know, I, you know, I get a chance to go outside. There's a lot of really great places to walk around here. Um, so normally I'll do some kind of like mid afternoon activity, whether it be just like doing some like work, doing some reading, doing some walking. Um, and everything always revolves around food, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> so just getting a chance to, you know, explore cooking and stuff like that, getting to explore kind of, um, you know, food that I always told myself I didn't have time to do or time to make and stuff like that. And then uh, I've been on 
bunch of new TV kicks, watching shows that I, you know, haven't watched in a long time. Um, so yeah, and, and then eventually I fall asleep. I'm not particularly a scheduled person. I kind of like to be a little erratic about it. Mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. See, I always, I'm trying to find something to give me structure, or at least in the beginning of all of this. I, I'm a very structured person. Like the OCD in me really comes out. And I like, right. as soon as all this kind of went down and it was like, it was like a weekend when it all went down. Like mm-hmm. we got the email about MTNA school right afterwards. Like everything all happened so quickly. I remember I like, I was like throwing a hissy fit every day just cause I didn't know what to do. And I couldn't really go to school to practice. Right. So it was just- Yeah, the practice, that's tough. Yeah, so that's like maybe the one thing that like we all like need in our lives to a certain degree, even if it's not serious practicing, even if it's just noodling on the horn, like it's yeah. just something to fulfill that like need to play. Totally. Um, agree. Yeah. So I mean, now I'm starting to get back into a little bit of a routine. Like I said, in my last video, um, Helios has been like safely rehearsing again, oh, that's which nice. has been yeah, which has been really nice. We have this really big rehearsal space at ASU. And um, we're able to space out enough where you know, we feel safe. That's um, that's wonderful. I mean, and you know, getting a chance to rehearse in the summers too. That's that's a rare thing for collegiate quartets. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's awesome that you guys get to do that. Yeah, thanks. You know, it's definitely helped keeping us, or at least me, like it's keeping me feel like things are normal, yeah. even if they're Absolutely. not. Um, but yeah. It, one of those things that you were you would do during the day are any of them particularly your favorite Ooh, see the thing is that like i i kind of gave up video games video games were like a big part of my life as a kid and i when i got to college i you know i didn't really have time to do it so it's kind of nice to indulge like getting a chance to be a kid again and kind of get a chance to you know play some games and just relax and in that way so mm-hmm. uh, and you know i uh Actually, we just got a Nintendo Switch um, yesterday. Hey, awesome. Yesterday, so very excited to kind of you know everyone talks about it and like I think even one of your your previous people was talking about playing the Switch and stuff like that. So I'm very excited to finally get a chance to to do what everyone's been talking about. I think it's yeah. like turnip prices or something. I some, Animal Crossing. I was yeah, just yeah, gonna yeah. say you need to play Animal Crossing. I know. Uh, I know. Wilson Poppenberger. We were talking about it. And, oh yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. He, He's got like the five star island and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. You should totally look, get that look, game. Look out, look out, Matt and Wilson. I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, are there any fun things or like projects, anything you're working on right now, maybe for the fall? Any recording projects, performances that you're looking forward to? Um, I'd say the only really big thing I have coming, coming up is, um, you know, the quartet. If we get a chance to start rehearsing again, we have a bunch of pieces that we all kind of like. The nice thing about not feeling like we have to work towards something immediately is we all took a ch- time to figure out what pieces we really liked and to create kind of programs that uh, we felt reflected our own vision and our own mm-hmm. uh, tastes and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of really cool pieces that I'm really looking forward to putting together with them and getting a chance to, you know, rehearse and record those things with them. Um, yeah play some performances um but that's so great that you guys are staying together even though you yeah know, you're not all yeah yeah they're they're such nice people and uh you know we all there's like a there's like like a kinship that kind of gets created through you know working with your quartet mates and mm-hmm. it was really nice that we all could decide to stay together so i'm really looking forward to working with them um i'd love to get some recordings out it's you know i was really banking on a on a master's recital to get a chance to kind of you know, get a more free, free uh, recording session out of it. But yeah, exactly. Some things will definitely come come down. You know, I'm I'm hoping that there'll be some time to uh, to do those things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at least in my case, I just switched to the um, saxophone performance degree track here. Oh, I was originally that's... education. Thank right. you. I did it halfway through last year, and one of the requirements is doing two degree recitals versus one. Mm-hmm. So I had one scheduled for um, this past semester, but obviously things, you know, didn't work out. So now I need to do two degree recitals next year. So one in the fall, one in the spring. So right. hopefully I can get like two 
separate programs going and get two free recording sessions going, which would be that's, nice. That's a lot of music. But it's a lot of music. Be- yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like everyone's going through a similar thing right now. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the weird thing is that like I, I had a very similar situation to kind of COVID last year, my first year, my master's, I, uh, I contracted MRSA, uh, which is a type of like super virus. And I lost actually the last month and a half of my, my first year, my master's, I couldn't play this accent. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. It, it was, I don't really tell, tell it a ton, but yeah, like I, I basically, I couldn't play the instrument and they canceled my recital for that year. And it happened like two days before fish shop actually. And I had to, I had to pull out of the competition with my quartet, which was, Oh such no. Um, but, um, yeah, at the time, uh, you know, I lost my first master's recital, so I had to do it in the fall. And then I was supposed to do the same thing you did, where it's two recitals in one year. Right. But found a way to get out of that again. So here we are. Well, I mean, you got that piece of paper that says you graduated. So <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> All right. So I have kind of a random question for you. Mm-hmm. Um, would you rather play a size five reed on any horn for the rest of your life? And it can't be like a weak one. Like you can't like let it sit and Not soak. Like a heart like, hell five or something like that. No, no, no. Like straight up, like plywood. Sure. Or would you only play Sapronino sax for the rest of your life? Ooh, I feel like you asked this before, and I think, I think when I watched it last time, I was saying that I would I would do the Sapronino for sure. Yeah, I, I it was a, a slightly different question with Dylan. I asked him if he would only play Boza Aria for the That's rest right. of his That's life. Right. Yeah. I would play Boats of Aria every day. I love that piece. That's but, a great piece. Uh, no, I would, st- I, would st- I would stand by the Sopranino. I think, you know, there's oddly enough, actually a, a couple of really interesting pieces for Sopranino saxophone. You know, there was that, really? there was that, um, that Marcos Balter piece that uh, Professor Sullivan and Professor Scheman did, the, the, which was yeah. a piccolo trumpet and so- Sopranino, but they did the two Sopranino. That's a phenomenal piece. Really cool, really interesting. And I, I like Marcus's music, and, but... Uh, yeah, there's there's enough there's enough interesting rap out there. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe people will get tired of it. No, I think yeah, I think that I would choose the same thing because I don't even know if I could play a size five. Like, I I have a tendency to blow out my soft palate when I play on too hard to read sometimes. Oh, so yeah, yeah. I used to play on fours on soprano and it starts to hurt too much. Yeah. So now sometimes I'll do like a week or three and a half or something. Um, but I couldn't even, like, I don't even think I could physically play the horn <laughs> on a five. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I think I would do the Sopranino too. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. And besides, like, I already, like, I play, you know, a pretty standard three and a half, like across the board, like the, the vanilla, the vanilla, I play classical saxophone setup. Um, <laughs> but, but I always drift towards the softer side of the reeds. Like I, I hate feeling like I have to battle a reed. It's just like. That's the last thing I want to deal with when I'm playing the saxophone. Yeah, I, I get really lazy. And this, I, I blame it on quarantine, but it's it's all the time. <laughs> I just get lazy and I let my reads get weak and I'm like, yeah, it'll be fine next week when I have a performance. And then it's never right. fine. So I need to like get on that and actually start conditioning reads and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, do you have a favorite movie, maybe a favorite movie of all time, and then a favorite quarantine movie? Because I know, like, there are some people who have movies during quarantine that they'll just watch, like, like every day. Ooh. I don't know. I don't think I don't think I've watched something, like, religious. The only thing I do is that every morning I make sure to listen to uh, the Drake and Josh uh, soundtrack. Uh, that is, really? That's kind of a weird morning tradition that we do when we sit down to eat breakfast. Um, Because it used to be for a long time that we sat down to breakfast for Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You. It's kind of just like a long running joke that we just never stop. Um, So, but in terms of movies, uh, I would say, you know, the more I think about it, the more I kind of always go back to Coco. I, it's a good I movie. That movie. That movie was, and it came at a very perfect time in my life. You know, I was thinking about, you know, like um just you know it relates to so many aspects of like you know family and life and you know the meaning of you know what it what it all kind of relates to and uh beautiful movie love that movie so yeah 
I actually just saw it for the first time. I think last winter. It's it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Just it and like you know, it's just like the artwork and just like the the story behind it. Really beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, and then. Yeah, I don't. But quarantine movie. Oh, quarantine movie. Uh, I would say. I we started we recently started watching this absolutely absurd movie. Um, I'm trying to remember. It's I think it's called Game Over Man or something like that. It's basically oh. kind of like The Hangover, but but with the the cast of workaholics. Um, okay. It's very very dumb. It's very very stupid. It's kind of like yeah. It's kind of like The Hangover meets um, Die Hard. Is the best okay. way to describe it. It's very silly. Huh. Very dumb. But that's that's my type of humor. I just I love I love yeah. that silly, stupid, like makes no sense. I'm gonna humor. have to check out that movie. I'll, I'll I'll make sure that that's the title. But yeah, it's very funny, very very silly. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, is there a certain like comfort food or food that like you just really like? I don't know. Are always craving? Mm. I don't, like there's some food now that I'm like trying my best to cook versus just like get delivered in, but I usually always end up getting like Thai food. I always get Thai food delivered. Like last night I got Thai food and it was <laughs> so good. Is there like a certain food that you just love to order, especially during, you know, times like this when we aren't really going out? I am such a barbecue sucker. I love barbecue. I just can't get enough of it. And there's like an amazing barbecue place, like a block and a half from where I live. It's Perfect. called Hattie's Barbecue. It's like a it's like an Evanston treasure, and uh, I would say that we've spent too much money there. And it's, <laughs> it's like one of those places you spend ten dollars and you spend the rest of the evening holding your stomach, just being like, "Oh, oh God, how did we do that?" Um, yeah. But oh, I love barbecue. That's so awesome. Like, what what's like your typical meal there? Oh, they have um, so they have like rib tips, and you can get like rib tips slathered in sauce and then they put like a piece of bread and then underneath that is just a bunch of french fries and so by the end you just get like these the like, greasy soaked in barbecue sauce french fries oh it's to die for that Such sounds a- so amazing yeah if you ever come up we're getting heckies because that place is yes awesome. i am totally down <laughs> um so i've been asking this question to almost all of my um all my guests now and do you have a, like a memorable performance that you can say like confidently was your best musical experience and maybe one that was your most terrifying musical experience? Sure. Um, I would say that my best musical experience was, uh, so my, in 2016, um, in the summer between my junior year and my senior year of college, um, I had the opportunity to work with uh, a composer, David Mislanka, which most people know him through his saxophone quartets or his concerto and something like that. Um, when I was at Brevard Music Center, I heard his saxophone concerto for the first time, and I was like, this is it. I, I'm pretty confident that I want to do this for the rest of my life. Um, anyway, he's an MSU alum, and he came to coach the saxophone quartets uh, one visit when the band was playing a piece. I reached out to him and I had the opportunity to actually go to his home in Montana. Um, I went out and I flew out, I I got a pianist that I was working with and we learned his sonata and his concerto. And uh, we flew out to work with him and we basically did like an artist intensive or I don't know, something like that where, uh, you know, I would spend the day with him and we, we, like me and my pianist and him would spend the day together he would go through parts of his life and then we'd play and then we'd talk about music and we'd get food mm-hmm. and then kind of rinse, rinse, repeat and stuff like that. And uh, I remember um, I was playing the second movement of his sonata and, you know, Dave is a really quiet, really spiritual guy. Um, and we were talking about certain aspects of performance and, and one of the big things he was trying to impart on me was this uh, idea of that every moment is kind of a universe that exists and to be okay with existing in the moment um which is you know something kind of loosely based around like his his study of of buddhist buddhism um so anyway um i remember very vividly it was like one of the last days that we were working together and we were playing part of the second movement or maybe we did a run of it 
he was he was going to hear the beginning, but we ended up actually playing the whole way through because he didn't stop. Um, but I felt like in that moment, like you know, we're always so barraged with life all the time, and I can't. Right. I, I admit that even when I'm performing, I can't help but think about things sometimes. But yeah. that was the moment that I felt like I was really present and present with myself, you know, and present with like the like the, the pianist I was working with. Yeah, and. I remember we finished the end of the second movement, um, and it by by no means was a you know a phenomenal performance. I I have a recording of it. It's actually not that good, um, but uh, you know, and we just stopped and he understood. We everyone in the room understood that we got that that idea, and it was like kind of a really beautiful moment between like feeling like I understood what he was trying to tell me and feeling like I could I could reach that at that time. So, right. Um, I would say that, you know it was it was a performance for one person, but um, definitely one of my favorites. Um, yeah, that's and then that's amazing. Worst worst one is a very drastically different story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was in high school. I w was doing a concerto with a with a local regional orchestra, the South Coast Symphony, and it was a great opportunity. Um, I got to play Tableau de Provence, like. I got to do like five different performances with the orchestra and I loved that piece and I, and they were really nice to me and stuff like that. And we had the opportunity, we had like a full day where we were going to do three children's concerts and then the night concert with just like the, the symphony. But we were doing these like educational concerts where I got to teach them like what the saxophone is and like that whole experience was phenomenal. But the second performance, the, the mid afternoon concerto performance, um, we got to the end of the fifth movement, which, you know, um, uh, is like, you know, it's really fast. And I was, of course, a high schooler and playing it too fast um, than I should have. But, you know, the piano comes in two beats before the piano, but before the saxophone does, you know, they start the melody mm -hmm. and then you kind of play it in canon with them and it creates this counterpoint. Um, the second performance of that day, I didn't come in totally forgot I was playing it for memory and so I totally I totally forgot what beat I was supposed to come in I, I heard the orchestra start playing and then I was like uh oh and I just froze and I just couldn't remember what I was going to do and I remember I just you know and it's so fast there was no way I was jumping in like that last yeah beat, really gnarly um and uh I just improvised an E major I remember I just like I had no idea what was happening I just like I was like noodle your fingers look confident you're you're dying inside but like let's just roll with it and and then you know that last bit where it's like and i just remember i had to get i had to land on like a i think it was an a or something like that you have to do a little chromatic thing and then it's over and i got through it it felt like an eternity oh my gosh i just oh my god i was like oh my god i'm butchering this i can't like what's happening and i remember i, I you know i did my bow i smiled and then i ran outside of that concert hall and just like bawled in like the middle of like in the middle between like the where the musicians are staying in the concert hall and um, terrifying absolutely terrifying oh my I god i look back on it relatively fondly knowing that like you know you can even forget a page of a concerto and yeah like it's about the end of the world yeah you got back or like you finished it <laughs> right that right as much as i could but i'm very glad there's no recordings of that <laughs> yeah Damn, that's that's so relatable. I feel like when you're playing from memory, there's always, always you know performances like that. Like my my most recent experience, I was doing the the NASA semifinal round. Mm -hmm. I was playing Wings, and I I've done it from memory um, multiple times before in preparation for the competition. But I don't know if it were if it was nerves, if it was the you know the people in the organ hall. But I got there, and there were three whole lines. I just completely forgot. And it's not like I just skipped them. Like I stopped, played an extra note, and then just like my skin turned white. Yeah. And then I, I could just like feel the room drop. And no. then uh, I was thinking to myself in that moment, like, should I just stop? Like, should I just say, I'm so <laughs> sorry and move on? But I, I eventually got back on to like, it's the next fast part when you hold the genius. Like, duh, 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 duh. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. That, it's that so terrifying. It's a lifetime when you're just like, uh oh, you know, and it, yeah, it's yeah. like what you're saying. It's like, you have no idea, like it, it could be nerves. It could be anything, you know, when you're playing from memory, it's, you know, a, a large part of it is just being reactive. Like you also listen to yourself and like that changes how you remember the piece. And 
man. I, it I'm uses so a completely different side of the brain. Right. Like, right. Yeah. And like, you know, wings is hard enough. And then you try to play it from memory. Like kudos to you for even, you know, getting to that point because. Well, thank you. <laughs> that was a rough one. Yeah. It's so hard. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're about, it's about that time to wrap up. And I was wondering if you had a message of any kind to say to whoever's walking or wa- watching, not walking. <laughs> Hopefully, you might be walking. I don't know. <laughs> Anyone who's watching, um, maybe something to help, you know, keep motivated during quarantine, maybe some musical advice, life advice, anything. Sure. Um, I would say that personally, um, one of the big things that's always gotten me through what what we do, um, you know, and it's, it's a tough, tough, li- tough line of business that we're in. Um, but, uh, what I always come back to is that music at its core is still play, you know, the act of playing, you know, and I mean, that's, it's in the title, I guess it sounds a little silly now, but, um, you know, like, you know, we always try to come up with these structures and these systems and we have to learn all these polyrhythms and, and how they work into each other and realize that like, you know, no note on the saxophones in tune and everyone freaks out about that and all these, there's always things to worry about, um. But some of my favorite performers and my, and my favorite performances are people that there's still that element of joy and play to it. So, mm-hmm. you know, whether that be loosening up what your idea of success is at this moment, or whether that be, you know, maybe you don't have to do two hours of long tones before you play what you really yeah. want to forward to. Um, you know, re- re- remembering that at a certain point, um, we're still playing the saxophone um, and to not worry about maybe as many of the details because I, I also love to worry about the details. So I get it, but yeah, just keep it yeah, light. I'm, <laughs> yeah. That's a really great to hear. Cause like people always say, you know, don't study what you love because you might end up not loving it. Sure. I've heard that a lot. And like, you know, I feel like that it goes through phases. Like you go through months just grinding and maybe you don't love it. Like maybe you want to go home and nap and not practice Right. And that's okay. Like, I feel like that needs to be normalized a bit because I, I, I mean, I'm with you. I'm totally for taking days off, but I know like too many people are, you know, every day, same, same practice method every day. And, you know, if, even if you're tired or you feel sick, you need to practice. And I've just never been Sure. You're down with that. Yeah, I mean, there's some people that like, you know, ever everyone's wired differently. And if that's your idea of like, really, like, that resonates with you, and you need that, like, you know, and like, all, I guess, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess what it comes down to is that, you know, listen to what you need, you know, and sometimes, you know, sometimes that is like, I'm on death's door, but I need to play my, you know, my middle B long tones. But, <laughs> uh, but some people, you know, I'm on death's door and I just need to like sit down and I need to watch three seasons of Game of, games of, Game of Thrones um, you yeah. know, this week or something like that. But um, yeah, I don't know. Like <laughs> it's, you know, it's already hard enough to play saxophone, especially within a classical idiom. You know, it's not worth dying over, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. And it's about that time. Do you have a read with you? I do. I have an, uh, you can't even read my chicken scratch, but it's an old soprano read. This is supposed to say OS, which means old and soft. It's dated okay. 116. So, um, huh. and I'm pretty sure it's 116 from 2019 because I didn't use pencil on my reads this year. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> uh, this, is, this has been here for probably too long. And so this is, what a better way to get rid of it. Yeah, I actually have a read too because I forgot the one that I usually bring, so I need to break one <laughs> in this show. So uh, I don't know if you want to count down and we could break it together. So I have a different idea. Okay. I brought a lighter. No. I've done it once before for a very unrelated thing related to uh, uh, we wanted to just see if it would work. Okay. I would like to note that there is fire safety involved. Okay. And I've done this. It's not the end of the world. But All I right. want to ignite my read if that's okay with you. That that's totally fine. You know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna snap <laughs> mine now because so that's what, not what? even cool anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <absolutely. laughs> I was gonna give a countdown and I could light mine and you could you could snap. That's right. all right, man. You you ignite it. I'm I'm ready to watch. Ready? Three? Yeah. Two? One. 
so satisfying. Oh my god. It's actually pretty nice. That's really nice. Crisp, clean. What are the odds you try and play it? <laughs> <laughs> this would be a hard read. Yeah. Really, uh, but a real fire to the sound, so. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this has been a lot of fun, and thank you so much for coming on and being a part of this. This is really awesome. Yeah, thank you for doing this. Thank you for you know making this you know happen. It can create a sense of community and stuff like that. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. And you know, I'm actually going to be chatting with your roommate and his quartet. In oh a yeah. Bit. Uh, yeah, in a couple of days, and hopefully we'll get those episodes posted this week. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if anyone's watching that, you know, has questions or wants to talk to me about anything that I've mentioned or anything like that, you know, I think one of the big takeaways from Matt, this whole thing that you're doing, Matt, is that, you know, uh, we're all pretty friendly people and to not be scared to ask. And, you know, we are a community that's trying to support each other, you know, and even when it maybe sometimes doesn't always feel like that. Exactly. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, we're friends, so I'm sure we'll be in touch. But yeah, yeah take awesome. care. Have a great rest of your day. Um, ha yeah, have a good rest of your summer. And I'm sure I'll see you soon. Yeah. See you around, Matt. All right. Take care. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.